From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, I'm David Weston. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. We start with some big news that broke earlier this morning. Democratic vice presidential nominee Kamala Harris has suspended her campaign travel at least until Monday after two of her aides on the campaign trip plane tested positive for COVID-19. Welcome now, Chief Washington Correspondent Kevin Cirilli. So bring us up to date, Kevin. What do we know? The Biden campaign releasing a statement just hours ago in which they announced that Senator Harris sent two of her aides, sent two aides to Senator Harris that tested positive for COVID-19. Senator Harris has tested negative for COVID-19. She has halted all travel uh, through Sunday. She'll be back on the campaign trail, according to her campaign, uh, on Monday. Now, in the statement, we also gathered that they say the two aides did not come into direct contact with Senator Harris uh, as defined by CDC guidelines. But as an area of precaution, they are going to uh, halt travel uh, and suspend travel between now and Sunday. Meanwhile, we should note that this comes uh, as Joe Biden, Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden, is going to be uh, attending a town hall on ABC this evening. That is set to begin at, in the 9 p.m. Eastern hour. It comes as President Trump will also have a town hall at the 8 p.m. Eastern hour. Uh, and they will be uh, on and on ABC and NBC, respectively. So <laughs> this was supposed to be the night of the debate, but that's been obviously canceled. Yeah, we have dueling town meetings on two rival <laughs> networks instead. Is there any reason to believe that this information coming out of the Harris campaign will interfere with that town hall meeting from Joe Biden tonight? Or for that matter, with Kamala Harris getting back on the campaign trail, at least by Monday? No. Uh, and they are fully saying that they are uh, having rapid tests uh, throughout the, the several days that they regularly test both of the candidates, the staffers uh, and President Trump also weighing in uh, earlier today. He said that he takes frequent tests, but he did not specify how many tests and whether or not they are daily. OK, thank you so much to our chief Washington correspondent. He is, of course, Kevin Cirilli. Well, every day now brings some new development that may or may not affect the election. But what are the markets telling us about what matters really in this election? We're looking at ways in which the markets are pricing in the range of election possibilities, and we call that market metrics. And for today's installment, we welcome Mike Schumacher. He is Wells Fargo Global Head of Macro Strategy. So, Mr. Schumacher, thank you so much for being with us. I, I am fascinated by this question of are the markets telling us anything about the election? As you look at the markets, what are they telling you? Yeah, it's interesting, David. The thing we focus on really is the options market. And the reason that's important is that you can put a very clear timeline on events. So, for instance, there are options to trade with expirations of one month, two month, three month, that sort of thing. So one month takes us, what, 12 days past the election. And you might think, well, if all the market action is really implying that the election is going to be done and dusted within 10 days, you ought to see a big drop off between one and two month volatilities. And that's not really the case. Instead, there's a fairly small gap. So that tells us the markets are anticipating a fairly messy period. We think it's mostly the delayed election possibility, if you will, or delayed results. Possibly a little bit of Brexit thrown in there. But the markets are telling us it's going to be a pretty rocky time in, in late November, early December. So, Michael, there's been a fair amount of polling that we've had, as well as some developments in the campaigns, including President Trump getting COVID-19 himself and then recovering. Uh, have you seen a shift in those option markets over the last, let's say, two and a half, three weeks? A little bit. And really, it's gone not as much as I would have thought, given the change in the election odds. If you look at, for instance, the online markets on Predicted, still pricing almost a 60 percent chance of a blue wave. Now, it's down quite a bit, but still, it's it's quite high. And the chance of a Biden win was up at almost 70 percent about a week ago. Now it's in the low 60s. We anticipated that the options market would effectively say, with Joe Biden's chances increasing so much over the last few weeks, that, hey, this notion of a delayed result or a contested result becoming less and less likely. Therefore, there should be a very large differential. And there really hasn't been much of a change. So it seems to us the markets are somewhat at odds with what the the online markets are telling us. And again, Mike, to make sure I understand what you're talking about with the option, right now, I was just saying, will we know November 3rd or for that matter, within a week or so, as opposed to it'll drag out further without regard to whether it's going to be a President Biden or a President Trump? That's exactly right, David. So it's not the markets aren't really taking a view in that particular case on who wins so much as will we know in the Gee, we don't know who the winner is. That's a very tough scenario for markets. A lot of people like to look at the 2000 precedent. Definitely a risk off move. It was, what, 35 days from Election Day until George W. Bush was really 
deemed the winner. And during that time, the S&P fell, but only 5%. However, bond yields went crazy. The 10-year Treasury yield dropped about 60 basis points. So a very strong reaction, a very risk reverse, risk averse, sorry, reaction during that particular time frame. Well, and I was going to ask you exactly about that. Uh, are we seeing in the options market any indication of a bet on greater inflation? Because there are some people saying if uh, uh, Joe Biden were elected president, the odds go up of more inflation as he borrows more and spends more, invests more. There's been a lot of talk about that. And if you look at inflation-linked securities, for instance, tips in the U.S., they've done quite well for the last really six months. However, we think the big thing driving tips, frankly, has been the strong performance by equities. If you do a graph of 10-year break-even inflation, which is really the market's tool for pricing tips against the S&P 500, they track almost hand in glove. So is some of that perhaps a little bit maybe anticipating higher inflation, I guess, but it seems to us the more dominant factor is simply that it's been risk on and tips have benefited. So, Mike, let's move over to another political issue pending right now in Washington, and that is this fiscal stimulus that we seem to wait for forever. It doesn't come. Are you seeing activity in the options market that really gives you a sense whether the markets are anticipating fiscal stimulus anytime soon? We've seen activity not so much in the options market, but more in the direct markets for rates and foreign exchange. It seems to us that stimulus has been a very important driver of those markets for the last few weeks. Now, we've had the view for quite some time that one more stimulus package is very unlikely before the election. And from our perspective at Wells Fargo, it seems to get less likely by the day. But it's interesting, David, it does still seem to drive both the Treasury market and the foreign exchange market to what I would say is an unreasonable degree. We'll talk about the foreign exchange market for a minute. I remember that leading up to 2016, you could sort of look at the Mexican peso, and it was really, it was really linked to the, the polling numbers for then Donald Trump, now President Trump. The higher he went, the lower the peso went. Are you seeing trades like that? I heard, actually, for example, that the peso is doing better, whereas the ruble is doing worse. Yeah, I'd say the peso-ruble trade is interesting. Now, the ruble thing is a little tough to dissociate from the armed conflict nearby, so I think that's perhaps the, the more proximate cause, if you will. But taking a step back and looking at the dollar in general, we think it's an interesting view that the, the U.S. dollar probably benefits, oddly enough, if there's a messy result of the U.S. election. And the reason we say that is that the dollar has been perhaps the premier safe haven currency this year. Now, again, since March, it's been a risk-on atmosphere, so you'd expect the dollar to do poorly, and it has. But if the election results are not that clear for a while, or if they're contested in some shape or form, the U.S. dollar probably wins. So it's been a very interesting dynamic to really to look at the dollar and think about it in the context of various election scenarios. Does the same go for the Japanese yen? Because that often is thought of as a safe haven currency as well. I agree with you. Yeah, if you go back over the last several decades, the yen's typically been safe haven number one, maybe Swiss franc number two, dollar number three. This year, it seems to have flipped a little bit, and the dollar's moved up arguably to the top slot, at least by our reckoning. But when you think about the yen, we, we do think that's a pretty reliable safe haven going forward. Now, there's a change of leadership in Japan. Does it matter too much? Probably not. So I would put the yen up there pretty highly as well. Okay, Mike, this is really helpful. I find it very interesting as well. That is Mike Schumacher. He is Global Head of Macro Strategy at Wells Fargo. Coming up, Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz from the swing state of Florida is here on the race in her home state. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We turn now to Mark Crumpton for Bloomberg First Word News. David, thank you. As of tomorrow, voters in all 50 states will be able to cast ballots. Mail-in voting will be available in every state, while early in-person voting is already underway in more than half of the states. More than 17 million ballots have already been cast. That's according to the U.S. Elections Project at the University of Florida, and that smashes previous records. By this time in 2016, only about 1.4 million people had already voted. Supreme Court Justice nominee Amy Coney Barrett has enough support in the Senate to be confirmed. That from Majority Leader Mitch McConnell today. Leader McConnell says he expects Barrett's nomination to clear the Senate Judiciary Committee October 22nd and be on the Senate floor starting Friday, October 23rd. Leader McConnell added, quote, we have the votes. 
Democratic vice presidential nominee Kamala Harris is canceling her travel until Monday after two people involved in her campaign tested positive for COVID-19. The campaign said Harris was not in close contact with either person in the days before they tested positive, but her travel would be paused, quote, out of an abundance of caution. Senator Harris had been scheduled to visit North Carolina today and to travel daily until Election Day. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen left an EU summit today shortly after it opened after one of her staffers tested positive for COVID-19. Von der Leyen says she has tested negative but left the summit to go into self-isolation as a precaution. Despite the rising infection numbers across the 27-nation bloc, EU leaders still decided to meet in person, arguing that video conferences were too remote to have real diplomatic exchanges. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thank you so much, Mark. Our Swing State series is focused on Florida this week, and we welcome now Democratic Congressman Debbie Wasserman Schultz, a member of the leadership of the Democratic Party in the House of Representatives. Congressman, thank you so much for being with us. We're looking at Florida all this week. Give us a sense from your vantage point, particularly down there in southern Florida, down around Broward County, Miami-Dade County, how the election's looking. Well, you know, we're, we're, we've got Floridians voting like gangbusters, and it particularly on the Democratic side, we've seen a surge in casting of vote-by-mail ballots like we've not seen before. Normally, cycle over cycle, we see Republicans who have really voted more often by in vote-by-mail, and Democrats show up at early vote, and, you know, that's where the, the, the battle exists. We actually have had about a million vote-by-mail vote ballots cast already. Uh, Democrats have, uh, have cast 400,000 more vote-by-mail ballots than Republicans thus far, uh, and we haven't even started with early vote, which begins here on Monday. So the enthusiasm and people who are, you know, just voting, you know, every day is election day here right now, and, you know, we're not going to sit on our lead. We're going to go, you know, really roaring into early vote over that two-week period and, uh, and, and finish up on election day with a win for Joe Biden. Like just about every state, there's a difference as you go across the state about whether people tend to be Democrat, tend to be Republican. There are some parts, for example, up in the panhandle that may tend to be Republican in Florida. Will you have a big enough margin down there in Miami and around Miami to overcome whatever you see in the rest of the state? Well, I like what I'm seeing in our outcomes down here for voter turnout with vote by mail. The, the huge leads in Palm Beach, Broward, and Miami-Dade counties that we are racking up in Democratic turnout are going to really carry us with a very big cushion going into early vote. We have a huge push. We have, uh, you know, even though most of our activity has been virtual, we have phone banks and texting uh, events and postcard writing and, you know, calling every single day, events where, you know, elected officials like me, I mean, I've, I've been on Zoom calls and, and even socially distanced in-person events every single day nearly. So. We're feeling really good, uh, particularly in South Florida. You're right, we are divided into really sort of three states almost. North Florida, which typically votes more red. Central Florida is the true b battleground. And down here in South Florida, we're the Democratic base. And so making sure that we turn out, you know, with a big enough surge here in South Florida to carry and balance out some of the more red areas of the state, that's always critical. And we're looking really good right now, but we're not sitting on the lead. Florida also has a substantial Latino or Hispanic population as well. There have been some speculation that perhaps former Vice President Biden does not do as well with that population as perhaps some other Democratic candidates. Uh, what are you seeing in terms of his ability to connect with and really appeal to those voters? Oh, I mean, I think uh, Vice President Biden's visits to the state, as well as uh, Kamala Harris, Senator Harris's visits to the state, especially over the last month or so, you've seen the numbers shift in our direction. I mean, this is a president who has presided over a, a, a health care disaster, and it, disproportionately, people of color are being affected. Um, to say nothing of the total disrespect and, uh, and really vile nature in which this president has treated the Hispanic community uh, and Latinos all over the country and, and even talked about the, uh, the, their, their countries of origin being S-hole countries. Um, the, the backlash from the Hispanic community, I think, here is going to be significant. 
And David, add to that the fact that the number one issue for Hispanics in this in this state and really all across the nation is health care. Mm -hmm. And a week after the election, the Donald Trump administration is trying to get the Affordable Care Act tossed out as unconstitutional, and that'll take health care away from 20 million people. Hispanics really care about that, and they're going to vote. With, they're going to vote to elect Joe Biden because they want to make sure that they can preserve their health care, and they know he will. You talk about uh, Hispanics, other people of color being disproportionately affected by COVID-19 and concerned about health care. It's also true of seniors. You have a fairly yeah. substantial population of seniors in Florida. Uh, what is the situation there? Because as I recall, last time, 2016, President Trump did pretty well with seniors. You know, at the, at the moment, uh, and it's been trending this way in the last uh, several weeks, uh, the Biden-Harris ticket is ahead with seniors in Florida. We, you're right, we've not seen that in previous election cycles. And th th they're ahead because seniors see that Donald Trump has been grossly irresponsible and, and cavalier about his lack of concern for getting this virus under control, making sure we have a robust testing, contact tracing, and isolation program. In Florida, it was just revealed by my hometown paper this morning that the state is using a, you know, the rosiest picture of data for reporting so that it looks like we're less than 5 percent. But if you use the gold standard Johns Hopkins way of, of reporting, we're at over 11 percent. Our numbers are going in the wrong direction. 141 more deaths reported today. We, we have been among the top tier of hotspots, and seniors have, have really a huge percentage, have been a huge percentage of the cases and deaths. So they're, they're responding with their vote and their support for Joe Biden because he, they know that he's going to get a handle on this virus, treat it seriously, and not just discard it as a hoax and, and be as cavalier as, uh, as the vice president, as, uh, as Donald Trump has been. Congresswoman, for those of us old enough to have been around to cover 2000, we it has burned in our memory those hanging chads and what was going on down there in South Florida. Uh, now, we might not have hanging chads this time, but there could be other contests about some of the absentee ballots, the mail-in ballots, things like that. Are things fixed? Are you really confident we're not going to have a lot of contests that will really put into doubt the outcome in Florida? I am con confident because we've had since that debacle in uh, in 2000. I lived through it. I was elected to the state senate that year. Um, we have had for about 20 years no excuse vote by mail ballots, and so that's something that we're accustomed to doing. In fact, you know, thankfully we have many more opportunities for people to safely drop off their ballot at early voting sites. You don't have to send your vote by mail ballot in the mail. At once the early voting sites open on Monday all the way through to November 1st, there are bins at each voting site, early voting site, for people to deposit them, and they don't even have to go into the polling place. We are making sure, from our standpoint, that people sign their ballots, they understand the instructions, they have an opportunity to cure their ballots. Uh, they can, on most Supervisor of Elections websites, they can actually track their the status of their ballot. So I feel really good that on election night, what the advice we're giving our, our constituents and, and our, uh, our voters is, you know what, go out and vote for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Make their win significant, because our votes come in at, you know, starting at 7 o'clock on election night, because you have to get your vote-by-mail ballot in by then. So make it easy. Let's have an early night. Joe Biden wins Florida. Donald Trump can't become president again without the votes from Florida. And so let's all go to bed early when the votes from Florida are reported with a big win from Joe Biden. Congresswoman, uh, finally, uh, there also is some other business still pending before Congress. As we're told it's pending. It's the stimulus, the fiscal stimulus bill. And we hear up and down and back and forth. Uh, what do you think the prospects are, number one, of getting something done before the election? And number two, if something were to be done, whom would it benefit? Well, I'm con I, look, if something were to be done, uh, and it does badly need to be done, it will benefit the people who really have to, who are struggling economically. We had more unemployment numbers you know, going in the wrong direction reported this morning, it particularly hit hard here in Florida. Uh, we have a tourism and leisure-based economy, and that, that, that part of the economy has been decimated. We need to pass a bill so that we can make sure we provide more business, small business relief, more direct payments for people, make sure we provide that unemployment relief, and state and local help. And, uh, and Republicans um, have refused to come to the table and sit down and work out a reasonable compromise that, ha that covers the breadth of the needs of, uh, of our country uh, mm -hmm. to, get, to really wrestle this virus to the ground. And so we'll, we'll have a deal when they take this seriously. Um, otherwise, we're just going to be, you know, picking low-hanging fruit right. and 
dealing with it in a political way, which is unacceptable. Okay, Congressman, really thank you so much for being with us today. That is Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz, Democrat of Florida. Coming up later, we're going to get a different perspective on Florida with Republican Congressman Neil Dunn. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's been a big week for bank earnings, wrapping up with Morgan Stanley today. And to check on how it all came out, we turn now to Scarlett Fu. Hi, David. Yeah, Morgan Stanley, the last of the big banks to report its third quarter results. And like its peers, it got a lift from its trading desk thanks to increased volatility in the markets. Morgan Stanley's combined fixed income currencies and commodities and equity trading revenue rose 20 percent following near 30 percent increases at Goldman and 30 percent increase over at J.P. Morgan. Only Bank of America there at the bottom failed to post double digit percentage growth in trading, mainly because it didn't take on as much risk as its peers. Now, these trading gains help to offset the negative impact from provisioning for bad loans as well as low interest rates. The same three firms, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan, posted positive third quarter profit growth from a year ago. Morgan Stanley, by the way, can also count on stable revenue from its wealth management business as well, which uh, saw revenue increase 7% in the third quarter. We talk a lot about how there's this K-shaped recovery in the larger economy. The same have versus have not dynamic is also playing out in the banking sector as well. Uh, and you see that in terms of the share price reaction to earnings every day. According to Ken Leon, who's over at CFRA, Morgan Stanley Goldman and to some extent JP Morgan are on the right side of the world. They benefit from wealth creation with their fee-based recurring revenue model. Banks that are more dependent on commercial and consumer lending, they face low rates, no steepness in the yield curve, and challenges with loan losses. And what these guys need, what Citi, Bank of America, and Wells Fargo need, is volume. If you have low rates, you need volume. That's driven by loan activity, and that is hard to get a read on over the next 12 months. Year to date, you can see how things stack up. Wells Fargo, the hardest hit because of legacy issues like those fake accounts from years ago. And so as a result, uh, its year to date market cap has seen a drop of $133 billion. And you could see, of course, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, and J.P. Morgan. Well, not really J.P. Morgan. Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs <laughs> holding up a little bit better. So we go back to that theme once again, David. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much, Scarlett. It's a great report on the banks. Now, coming up, we're going to talk about the IMF. They're saying that we need more fiscal stimulus. Bloomberg's senior executive editor for economics, Stephanie Flanders, is here to talk about the state of the global economy and how much debt we can take on. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. The, he the head of the World Health Organization's Europe office says the exponential surge of coronavirus cases across the continent has warranted the restrictive measures being taken across the continent. Dr. Hans Kluge called the steps absolutely necessary and said more drastic measures might be needed to contain the pandemic. He warned that relaxing measures could lead to a five-fold increase in deaths by January. A longtime Republican senator is acknowledging that President Trump may lose next month's election. South Carolina's Lindsey Graham predicted in September that Mr. Trump would be re-elected, but at a Senate hearing today, he said Joe Biden has a, quote, good chance of taking the White House. Chairman Graham himself is in a tough re-election battle. His opponent, Jimmy Harrison, has raised a huge amount of money and has growing support in polls in South Carolina. In California, a heat wave is bringing another round of extreme wildfire danger. Temperatures have been hitting triple digits in many parts of the state. Forecasters say strong winds could spark new blazes in a region that already has seen some of the worst wildfires in state history. Power has been cut to tens of thousands of homes and businesses, and others are being urged to conserve energy. In Thailand, thousands of anti-government protesters staged a rally for a second straight day in the capital, Bangkok. The demonstrators defied a state of emergency declared by the prime minister to quiet escalating demonstrations. The protesters are calling for the resignation of the prime minister, a former army chief who staged a coup in 2014. They also want Thailand's constitution 
rewritten. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. Thanks very much, Mark. The IMF has been holding its annual meetings this week, and its managing director, Kristalina Georgieva, called on fiscal authorities to keep up the fiscal support for the global economy, even as she recognized that at some point down the road, we're going to have to start thinking about the deficits that we're running up. Welcome now, Wall Street Week contributor Stephanie Flanders, Bloomberg's senior executive editor for economics. So, Stephanie, thank you so much for being with us. So, uh, we're hearing, and certainly here in the United States, we don't seem to be doing much about it, but we need more fiscal stimulus. But what Ms. Gorgieva was saying, it's not just the United States. We need this for the global economy. Why do we continue to need this kind of fiscal help? Well, I guess we should we should pause to reflect on the fact that the International Monetary Fund has not historically been a great uh, source of, of fiscal stimulus and, and a booster for fiscal stimulus. Um, you remember even just in the, the last uh, global financial crisis, after supporting um, fiscal action to help economies for the first uh, year or two, um, they were among those who said we should, you know, was in favour of austerity in the Eurozone and elsewhere. So to have the head of the IMF saying, if anything, the danger is too little rather than too much, even as she unveiled a significant uh, rise in debt stocks and borrowing across the world uh, was quite was quite a thing uh, to behold. But of course, it's, it's facing, uh, she's reflecting the reality, which is that uh, economies are not out of the danger zone. And in fact, if you're certainly if you're sitting in Europe, you feel like you're going back into a very risky period with you know curfews being introduced across France, new tighter restrictions across large parts of the UK, the impact on the economy could be quite profound. So you can't turn off the support yet. So we all are very concerned about the uptick, uh, the surge, if I can put it that way, in the number of cases of COVID-19, certainly in Europe and here in the United States, much of the United States as well. At the same time, the, the, the lethality of it seems to have gone down. Not as many people are hospitalized or dying, are they? Well, it's interesting because that was what was happening in the summer. And I think there was a certain amount of um, uh, complacency even about the rising rates towards the end of the summer because they didn't seem to be accompanied by hospitalization rates. And it's certainly true that in the US particularly, we've got much better at treating. We've seen a very high profile case recently, but we've got much better at treating uh, coronavirus. Actually, across Europe, you are starting to see older people start to get the pop get COVID again, and that is starting to fill up hospitals again. So I don't, the idea that this is going to be really a much easier thing the second time around is, I think, wishful thinking, although we certainly have a better handle on how to treat it. We certainly seem to be hearing, as you say, ironically, perhaps, from the IMF, but also from the Federal Reserve, from Jay Powell, also Madame Lagarde, president of the ECB, that this is not the time to worry about the debt or deficit. When will be that time? When we know uh, that we are we have reached uh, the end of, of the recession and we can see the light in terms of a post-COVID world. I think the, the challenge, and particularly in the U.S., where you are having um, real difficulty in getting a getting further stimulus passed is you don't want to have a policy induced double dip in the economy even as you're still fighting um, the pandemic and I think the, the fiscal st the first round of fiscal stimulus all over the world and certainly in the U.S. was remarkably efficient at filling that hole that was being blown in the economy by COVID. Uh, we, we reckon that uh, more than 100 percent of the damage, uh, just the sheer income damage from COVID in the first wave was addressed by that massive fiscal stimulus package. But if you have nothing for this second wave, which seems now to be a risk, you can see why Jay Powell and others would be very concerned in the U.S. and why European governments would not want to turn reverse course yet. All the economists seem to agree we need to, to continue, even increase the fiscal stimulus. At the same time, are we putting off the time when there have to be other readjustments made in the economy for the long-term health of the economy? And I'm not talking about cutting back on fiscal stimulus. I'm talking about repurposing people and industries. I mean, you have a wonderful podcast called Stephanomics in which you talk about the jobs. Are we supporting jobs that maybe will go away? Yeah, if I'm allowed to boost for a moment on the Stephanomics podcast, actually this week we had a wonderful piece from Spain, from Cadiz, the southwest of Spain, making addressing exactly that point, which jobs are gone forever and which actually could come back. And there's a shipbuilding industry there that clearly has not come back uh, and is, a, is workers from there have then gone on to, for example, working in airline engineering 
Um, now they're all engineering for aircraft, for Airbus. Now they're uh, facing the possibility of long-term redundancy and asking themselves, is the airline business going to go the way of shipbuilding? And the honest answer is, for a lot of the economy, we don't know. Even, even the changes that we think are going to be permanent, you know, people wanting to work from home or people travelling for work less. In a few years' time, will we, will, we be, will we be laughing at those predictions that the world was going to change? The, what governments shouldn't be doing now is forcing businesses to prejudge what their future business model is going to be. And that probably means giving more support, even if some of it ends up being for jobs that aren't going to last. Well, that's interesting, Stephanie, because that reads, I think, in part against some of the debate in the United States about the stimulus, about whether it should be targeted or broad-based. Uh, we hear certainly from the Trump administration it should be targeted. We should pick the industries we need to support. What you're suggesting is maybe that might be a mistake. I mean, it lapses into a form of industrial policy at some point. It's so difficult, and I sympathize with all the, the finance ministers around the world who are trying to to decide how to do this because the, you know, and we've seen in the US actually, that the very broad programs uh, have had a lot of issues about, of, of uh, misuse of funds and uh, not going necessarily to quote unquote deserving parts of the economy. But the more you try and target, the more you are making those difficult decisions and maybe prejudging what the structure of the future economy is going to be. If you have a decent social safety net to begin with, and a good level of trust between government and uh, citizens, I think it's easier to make these choices. And that's what we're seeing. Some countries in Europe are finding it easier than others, in part because they have pre-existing ways of dealing with these very difficult challenges. Uh, often what's happening, certainly in the United States, I think perhaps in Europe to some extent as well, is there's a separation between what we call Wall Street and Main Street, that perhaps people who have invested in assets, equities, debts, various things, are doing quite well, when a lot of people on the street are not doing as well. That creates some political stress in the United States. Do you see any version of that in Europe? I think certainly in the UK, uh, we, we see that. And I think, and it's very graphic. I mean, I cannot think of a recession. Recessions are always very unequal in their impacts. You get certain industries affected and, and usually people at the bottom of the income scale do worse than people at the top. But I can't think of a recession where you had a historic decline in GDP causing ter terrible hardship for a big chunk of the population. And another quite large chunk at the top of the income scale has not only done okay, but has done very well. We saw recently the data uh, that trillions of dollars increased in the net worth of uh, the upper 10% of US households in the second quarter of this year because of that dramatic return of the stock market. And the UK has had, and parts of Europe have had similar, probably not as extreme, but there's a similar understanding that this has been a very unequal in its impact, not just you know, in terms of age groups, certainly, but also financially. That could feed into how we fix that fiscal hole we were talking about earlier. People are going to probably want to see, if we see tax rises, maybe it should be tax rises for those that did, did much better than everybody else in this difficult year. Interesting and provocative. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Always a treat to have you with us. That's Stephanie Flanders. She is senior executive editor and head of Bloomberg Economics. She's also a contributor to Wall Street Week, and we're going to air that Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern time here on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Coming up, jobless claims here in the United States moved back up last week, even as continuing claims fell. Douglas Holtz Eakin of the American Action Forum is here to take us through what the numbers are telling us and what should be done about it. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. U.S. jobless claims surprisingly moved up last week to just under 900,000, while continuing claims fell more than expected. Douglas Holtz Eakin, president of the American Action Forum, earlier served as the director of the Congressional Budget Office, and we welcome him back to Bloomberg now. So what do you make of the jobless numbers? Uh, is there anything we should make of them, Doug? I guess um, you, you shouldn't overinterpret any single number. As you know, weekly data can be quite noisy. But, uh, you know, as this has progressed, I have steadily placed less and less weight on initial claims and more and more weight on the continuing claims. Uh, because we've changed who can apply for benefits so dramatically and because we've had state UI systems that have been overwhelmed, those initial claims often don't reflect things that happened in the past week. They they reflect people trying yet again and finally being recognized as a claimant and 
and they reflect the, the performance of people who are self-employed or independent contractors, and we don't have any historical benchmarks for how they play out during a business cycle recovery. So I, I, I'm taking they're, they're high. There's no way around that. Uh, they, they reflect the fact that you know half of the people who lost their jobs earlier this year aren't back at work, and we know that. But in terms of progress, I, seeing those continuing claims go down, which means we're creating jobs, which is essential, is a good thing. And, and, and so it, it keeps me on the sort of basic trajectory I thought we'd be on, a quick bump back, which we saw, and then a steady climb out. And, and I done, didn't expect to be back at full employment in 2020, and, and, and I think those who did were probably really kidding themselves about sort of the capacity of the economy to get back fast and the realistic uh, progression in addressing the, the coronavirus, which was always going to have regional spikes and a resurgence in the fall. And we're seeing that. And so that, that's the world we're in. Well, the continuing claims, as you say, are coming down a little faster than was expected. They're still up over yeah. 10 million at this point. Yeah. Are we going to get back to that without the vaccine? And what are the prospects, not only of getting a vaccine, but of actually getting people to take it? Uh, I, I think we need the vaccine. I think there's no question about that. Uh, the alternatives, the, the, the substitutes for vaccines, are uh, an enormous advance in uh, daily rapid testing, uh, testing not for the stage of your uh, COVID-19 case, but for whether you're infectious or not. And, and those tests uh, would allow us to each to get up every day and lick a strip. And if it turns uh, blue, stay home. If it turns red, go to work, whatever. Um, you know, that, that's a way to, to deal with, with that. Or allow COVID-19 to be a less threatening disease by having a, uh, a set of therapeutics that can address it quickly. So, but, but I don't think we're going to get that relatively quickly that, that doesn't know doesn't look like it so we're we but we are going to get vaccines um the the administration's operation warp speed is a genuine success from a, a scientific perspective I, I think we'll probably have by the middle of 2021 three or so widely available vaccines for covid 19 they may work better or worse for different populations ages things like that uh, but they will have been developed in record time, uh, subjected to the same and higher levels of scrutiny than previous vaccines, and will provide some protection to the population. Right. Then comes the, the, you know, the, and I, and I, I want to say that I, I really have a great deal of faith in that. I know there's been a lot of public discussion about the FDA and pr political pressure on the FDA, and I think the administration has far from bathed itself in glory in, in trying to politicize the vaccine development. But the vaccine development itself is, is a terrific scientific accomplishment. Um, yeah. and, but, but convincing people of that is the key. Right. And so, you know, a recent Gallup yeah. poll showed that um, we used to have right. two-thirds of Americans who thought they would be ready right. to take a vaccine, and now it's down, down to a half. And if, yeah. if people don't take a vaccine, development doesn't mean anything. Doug, I won't, don't want to let you go without talking about stimulus. It sounds a little bit like the vaccine. Mm -hmm. doesn't look like we're getting it soon, but most people think we're going to get it sooner, sooner or later. We will get it. Is that good enough? I think it's not good enough. Uh, in the end, this crisis started, economic part of this crisis started, when high-income individuals stopped consuming services that involve personal contact. And there's nothing about sending checks to low-income households or bumping up UI or giving states money that fixes that problem. The yeah. only thing that fixes that problem is fixing the virus. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Doug. Always a treat to have you on. It's Douglas Holtz Eakin, American Action Forum president. Coming up, we're going to hear from the other end of the state of Florida. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The IMF has been meeting in, for its annual meeting this week, and the di managing director, Christine, Kristalina Georgieva, has said that we really need more fiscal stimulus. We need more rather than less. The worries about uh, debt levels uh, going up uh, are not for now. For now, the biggest worry is that we don't do enough to support the economy until we have a durable exit from the health crisis. With interest rates being record low, governments can borrow and inject, hopefully, not only a recovery, but a more potent, higher productivity-based growth so they can repay uh, the debt uh, they are ac uh, acquiring now. This is, however, not the case for low-income countries already in debt 
distress. And this is why it is so important that we make sure they, pro they are provided with relief and they are supported with grants and concessional financing, a big theme for our annual meetings. But what is the biggest risk to your outlook right now? I know you say the recovery is going to be uneven, but you've actually increased your projection somewhat. Well, the uh, situation today is less dire than it was a couple of months ago, but dire nonetheless. Uh, we are projecting minus 4.4 percent. And uh, as we all know, the big uh, problem we face is that we are not out of the woods of the pandemic yet. And until that happens, until we have this durable exit, uh, we have to be concerned uh, whether there is sufficient support for firms and for workers so we don't hit a wall of massive bankruptcies and a massive increase, uh, increase in unemployment. This is short term my biggest worry. Uh, longer term, we are very concerned about the scarring this crisis is bringing. There are sectors of the economy that are very severely impacted. Uh, Low-skilled workers, women, young people, they are hit hardest. Uh, and how we make sure that oh, inequality gosh, doesn't hard, expand dramatically as a result of this uh, crisis uh, with the uh, digital economy and those who can work there doing really well and uh, the rest of the economy doing poorly. That requires... Uh, we want to continue now our look at the key swing state of Florida with Republican Congressman Neil Dunn, whose district is in the panhandle of the state. Representative Dunn is a U.S. Army veteran and a surgeon who was elected to the House four years ago now. So, Mr. Congressman, thank you very much for your patience. I know we had a little technical difficulty there. Thanks for being here. Give us your sense from the panhandle, a different part of the state than, for, for example, Miami, how this election is looking. Well, so it, um, it's very, very conservative swath of the state up here. Uh, uh, you know, typically statewide elections in Florida are won. Uh, Republicans win up here in North Florida, and uh, and so uh, what we see is uh, very favorable. Um, you know, our farmers are suffering, unfortunately, not so much from the pandemic, but from weather. We've had so much rain that uh, a lot of our crops have been un, uh, unable to harvest. And, and while we have some great markets for soybeans, China's buying more soybeans than they ever had before, we tough to get them out of the mud uh, and deliver it. So there's some uh, put that on uh, the quarantine on top of Hurricane Michael, which hit us a couple of years ago. And it's been kind of a rough season for them. Yeah, just missing some locusts and some pestilence <laughs> down there as a practical matter. But give us a sense of what the issues are that are important to your voters in your district. What are they going to vote on number one issue? I think un unequivocally they're going to vote uh, on the economy, number one. Now, everybody wants to see the economy come back. You know, we were doing really well this time last year, and and now we're uh, we're struggling uh, nationwide. In fact, globally we're struggling uh, with uh, with the economy. So uh, you know that's number one. Uh, obviously, people are uh, upset about the uh, uh, you know the the fact that they're locked out with the virus. I think I have some good news on that though. You know, uh, you mentioned I was a doctor earlier, so I've spent a lot of time with Operation Warp Speed, and I think there's some very good news coming out of that, not only the vaccines, but the therapeutics. In fact, this week, Operation Warp Speed is reviewing no less than three legacy drugs that uh, show great promise as true virucidal, just like antibiotics, these would be antiviral drugs, and they're legacy drugs that we understand the safety of and the... Uh, and the uh, profile, the therapeutic profile of them, because they're used for other things. So I think we're going to get some really good news on that soon. And uh, the other thing we need to do is focus on who needs to be quarantined. Obviously, those who are infected, those who are infectious, and the people at risk. That's the elderly and the uh, and the immune compromised. Yeah, well, exactly. Talk about the elderly, the seniors, as it were, because we've seen some reports now out of Florida where you have a fairly substantial senior population that people may be turning against President Trump because they don't like very much the way he handled COVID-19. Are you seeing that in your district? Not at all, really. So, I mean, you know, to be honest, uh, you know, they talk about uh, 
he, did he play down the virus? You know, they teach us in medical school to to tamp down panic, not to stoke panic in an epidemic. Uh, you know, and I, I was in the army and treated a lot of epidemic diseases, broke out in, specifically in, in refugee camps, uh, uh, cholera and things like that. Gee, panic doesn't serve anybody. We need to uh, we need to think our way through that. And I think we have some good answers for it. And we're getting a lot better at treating it. You watch the mortality rate of this disease drops precipitously uh, in the last few months as the doctors have gotten a better handle on how to treat it. Yeah. Congressman, I'll end with an unfair question. Are we going to have an answer about who won in Florida before we go home on the evening or the late night, overnight of November 3rd? So I think Florida is actually going to be an exceptionally good state for you now. I think we've kind of got the supervisors of elections under control, and we've had a longstanding absentee ballot uh, program in the mail, so we know how to process those things. Uh, I think that Florida is going to be a shining spot uh, on the evening of November 3rd. Uh, I'm not so sure about some other states. We've seen some, some, uh, mm -hmm. some really sad um, uh, results in the primary in New York, New Jersey, some other yeah. places. Yeah, a lot of challenges, no question about it. Thank you so much once again for your patience, Congressman. That's Congressman Neil Dunn. He's Republican of Florida. Coming up on Balance of Power, we're going to continue on Bloomberg Radio. Join us over there. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and on radio.